Uh, then uh, the, this next slide really talks about the history of the Louisiana Purchase and how it was modified uh, by virtue with the treaties with Spain. <clears throat> so for a time, the Arkansas River became the border uh, between the United States and Spain, right at the 100th meridian, basically saying the 100th meridian up to the confluence where it connected to the Arkansas River, which is exactly where, the, where Dodd City is right now. That's how it got its location. And the border then was the Arkansas River all the way up to the headwaters, and then north uh, from that point, creating Wyoming. So it was the border between the United States uh, and uh, Spain and Mexico uh, for several years. So it gives you the sense of the prominence of, it, of the river itself. Of course, the river became much more prominent again in more, more recent times in 1821 with the Santa Fe Trail. It started out in Franklin, Missouri, and went across obviously and hit the Arkansas River uh, and moving out further to the west, all the way over to Bent's Fort, which you see basically right near La Junta, Colorado, uh, and then went south of the mountain route going down to Santa Fe. Um, like I said, I grew up in Dodd City. So I remember being uh, commemorating the actual Santa Fe Trail ruts as a Boy Scout. Um, and very close to the Cimarron route cutoff. Um, and um, so you can actually still see the ruts there for those of you who have been out in Western Kansas or choose to, to look at it as well. Uh, very interesting history, but it, again, it reinforces how important the river was uh, for individuals, uh, for what supply, water supply, but also a barrier in some senses to uh, cross because it had a lot of water flow at that point in time. So that kind of gives you a recent, some sort of history background as we talk about it. The modern history you know well, um, in current context, I won't go to, to work on that business. Let's talk about my trip as we talk about it. And I've broken it down into six sections that I think may be of, of interest to you as we go forward here. The first section really is Tennessee Pass to Canyon City. Um, and this is what the map looks like. So this area that we're talking about, the first section goes from Tennessee Pass down to Canyon City, which really is a very wild part of the river and uh, a very, uh, I think it's, it has a lot of different contrast to it. Like I said, I wanted to start this most recent time period in 2018 uh, at, the, at the pass. So I decided to collect water at the upper reaches, but also snow at the upper reaches as well. because so I really wanted to carry a drop of water and follow a drop of water from the continental divide down to the Gulf of Mexico um, as a way to kind of um, follow where that water came from and where it goes. Obviously in the upper reaches of Colorado, it is very, uh, it's a small trickle, it gets a little larger and larger. Uh, it could actually, you know, it comes out in, with the uh, turquoise reservoir and uh, floated across that, paddled across that, and the water comes out from that point and quickly becomes a torrent, a uh, wild ranging river, uh, which becomes very difficult to traverse in a kayak. So, um, uh, as you can see, uh, very turbulent, very rapid waters uh, going through here. So, I wanted to. Uh, be able to avoid death and injury in this area um, so we can get, get some sense of it. Railroad bridge on the Arkansas River looking upstream. And I, I might say something here is what I call it the Arkansas River. Um, many folks, it's outside of Kansas, I call it the Arkansas River. I tried to avoid that. Uh, just some history that way. Uh, actually, it's called the Arkansas River by, because of a misprint uh, done back in the 1800s. Uh, some chartographers were actually recorded as being A-R-K-A-N-S-A-U-S, uh, and that created the Arkansas uh, pronunciation that stuck in the state of Arkansas. It's actually legislated in Arkansas to pronounce that way, uh, but I still call it the Arkansas uh, because I'm a Kansan, what can you say? So moving on this point area here, I, I put this map up because from the uh, area of uh, basically uh, from Tennessee Pass down to Canyon City, it is a recreational area and it's interesting history because in the area up here around near Leadville, here's where Leadville is, here's where Turquoise Reservoir is, uh, the history of this was basically um, tied to uh, the silver mining industry. You know, Leadville, Colorado was this lead mining, uh, was a silver mining community, a baby doe and the legendary uh, aspects, the matchless mine are historically kind of broken into those areas. And once indeed uh, the silver went away then the community went away as well, except for the mining of molybdenum, 
which is a strong additive for steel making and other products throughout the world, uh, is in this area as well, one of the largest deposits of molybdenum. But the extraction of molybdenum and trying to get out really was a caustic process, really polluting the river back in the 40s and 50s, making this really a river that was nobody wanted to touch, literally. Um, and the area became, uh, the, the area was not known for its recreation purposes. It was actually known for its production of vegetables, uh, which uh, was a very prominent and very lucrative business uh, until about the 1960s, when indeed, 50s and 60s, when indeed Southern California developed with all the water marketing aspect of this way. And this area fell into depression. Uh, in fact, Salida, uh, which now is known more prominently for all the uh, trout fishing and recreation activities, um, actually built a concrete wall in downtown Salida, about six feet tall, to wall the community off of this polluted river. Well, the Environmental Protection Agency gets established, and I think that's one of the benefits. They clean up the river. The river became very much a now much more able to go ahead and harvest uh, aquatic life and be, uh, be free of chemicals and heavy metals. Uh, to the point that the Norwegians came in in the 1970s and started doing kayaking and rafting in the area as being an experience. And they kind of, uh, I guess, uh, acculturized the, the area to go ahead and bring in thousands of people across the world to go ahead and do rafting in this area. Um, and that's why the Arkansas headwaters, uh, you see recreation area is put in place. Because the Norwegians came in, there was a lot of conflict between property owners and those uh, trying to provide, and those who wanted to go ahead and recreate on the river. Uh, conflicts actually ensued in some sort of gunplay, uh, but there are some good economic benefits. So they actually uh, approached the Colorado legislature to put in place the Arkansas headwaters recreation area, a governmental unit, uh, which basically uh, uh, associates and extracts, if you will, or requires permitting along the river. And uh, you'll, if you have ever done uh, rafting in this area, you will know that there's cameras along the way as a way to provide a record of your experience, but also to go ahead and make sure that uh, every individual head basically gets charged a certain amount of money to pay for additional access along this area. I tell you this story because it changed the economy uh, of this all the way down to Canyon City through the Royal Gorge. Um, to basically say that it was, uh, it is now a billion dollar industry. Um, so about $750 million comes from rafting. Sorry, yeah, exactly about $250 million comes from trout fishing in the recreation area, to the point where now uh, it's hard to go ahead and find a condo or an apartment, if you will, in Salida uh, that's affordable. Uh, $200,000 apartments and so forth in that area, which is difficult for those who serve pizza in Salida to make that happen. So Salida is now turned into an area that is, is wonderful and well received. The, the wall that I talked about was in this area here, now has been taken out and they now build restaurants and becomes a very strong part of the economy. So um, the rafting experience is very strong. As I said before here, I did the rafting as a way to get through safely. I'm the person in the yellow hat over here. <clears throat> uh, and it was a wonderful experience. If you've not had a chance to go through the Royal Gorge rafting, do take that chance. Uh, you have to get training and so forth and wetsuits, but it really is well worth the trip. You can see the vegetation is almost devoid or the, the canyon almost is devoid of any vegetation, but what a majestic viewpoint uh, coming through that area. So I did that by virtue of raft, uh, again, because I was trying to uh, avoid injury and death. And it was a great experience to go through in that location. Uh, coming out of the of past the Royal Gorge, I had some friends with me. Uh, this is the area just below Canyon City, uh, flowing into Pueblo Reservoir. That's my kayak there in the red, the red paddles. Uh, but I show you that video because it gives you a sense of the serenity that really now takes place. It comes from a small trickling mountain stream through a torrent that drops about 7,000 feet and then several hundred miles uh, and then kind of comes out into the prairie and becomes calm uh, and now becomes now changes of its use uh, become very well tied to agriculture versus the tourism industry. Um, so the next portion of the trip, or the trip that I want to talk about is going from Pueblo Reservoir to Deerfield, Kansas, which becomes really a story about uh, ditch irrigation and water quality and 
fighting over water rights uh, for, from that point, Eastern Colorado and Western Kansas. So this is the area that I'm talking about, uh, going from this area all the way to Deerfield. And Deerfield is that segment point, uh, which we'll talk about in just a second, but it's significant because that's where no water comes down the Arkansas River. I think in order to understand though the, the way that the Arkansas River kind of functions in this area uh, is really to understand the hydrology and uh, the uh, really with recharge and groundwater use for irrigation. Um, so as we, we know that you know recharge comes in from basically uh, water as well as uh, rivers going into the ground, the alluvial area, and then uh, pumps get put in place to go ahead and take that water and use it for irrigation purposes, groundwater withdrawal, and they have what's called the, the water table gets sucked down the cone of depression. Uh, the amount of water flow that kind of gets in, if it's down through elevation, it then gets released into the Arkansas or into the rivers as well, and the actual groundwater kind of comes and feeds the stream. Uh, which is the way the pattern really worked until this became much more dominant uh, from the 1950s and 1960s. Prior to 1950, 1960, the Arkansas River had good flow. Um, and uh, the, uh, the river basically, as you know, that area is, goes over one of the largest bathtubs, I'll say, in the world, the Ogallala and High Plains Aquifer. Uh, so the, those are ancient waters from the ancient sea that covered Kansas millions of years ago. Uh, and for uh, until recent times, the aquifer was giving up its water to the Arkansas River, and that really augmented flow coming out of eastern Colorado into western Kansas, um, that kind of connection. Uh, and the reservoirs get put in place to go ahead and hold back that water. Uh, Pueblo Reservoir was created uh, as a way to go ahead and uh, hold back water for irrigation purposes and water supply for the community. Um, and it really had its history based upon uh, flooding that occurred in Pueblo in the 19, early 1900s, where uh, water came out of uh, the areas of the Arkansas River and flooded out and, and uh, killed uh, almost, you know, 80, 100 people and destroyed much property in downtown Pueblo. They decided to go and create a reservoir that's a private reservoir for water supply for uh, basically Colorado Springs and parts of Denver and also Pueblo and downstream. So from this point forward, every drop of water is managed, accounted for, and parceled out for various pur purposes. And this is the area right near Pueblo Reservoir. As it goes through Pueblo uh, and comes out of the reservoir down through Pueblo, uh, it comes out and looks like this. Water becomes now not really an aesthetic fashion, but it becomes really a conveyance for water for various purposes. And this is the actual water dish outside Pueblo. Pueblo does have a waterfront. It actually is a storm sewer system that's been kind of dubbed a, a, the river. It's not, it's only about, you know, four or five blocks long, but very nice and very pretty. This is the actual river and how it gets channelized. I did not flow this, uh, do this river because of the uh, number of dams that were in this area uh, and difficult to cross. Uh, so it gives you a sense uh, they had to walk around that area or drive around that area as we go forward. The river then, like I said, becomes managed and they're uh, further on down from the system, uh, becomes places where there are uh, low water dams that are not really on the maps and charts very much and it gets channeled out for various ditch irrigation purposes. Uh, and coming across a dam is kind of interesting because you can't, you can hear them, you can't see them. It becomes as you're approaching them, uh, you see kind of a horizon and then you hear the water and you say, oh my goodness, I better kind of work around that. So this is a, an example of one of the many uh, diversion dams for ditch irrigation uh, between uh, Canyon City and Deerfield, Kansas that are then used for irrigation purposes uh, in eastern Colorado and western Kansas. So this is the dam I had to portage around today. Water diversion structure, but have done so safely and successfully. Now I show you this as well because the on the previous day I had a uh, encountered one of these low water dams as well. I approached it and when I got close to it, um, I knew that I had to go one way or the other. Obviously, I chose the right hand side of the river. That was the wrong place. It was marshy, couldn't get out uh, and around the area. So I went back upstream, went to the left side, which was a very high embankment, uh, about 15 feet at about a 45 to 50 degree angle. Uh, so I pulled my kayak up and as I pulled my kayak up, my paddle slips out and goes out on the river and goes over the dam and gets stuck in a snag right below the headwaters of the toe of the dam. 
Um, so I said, okay, pulled my kayak up, uh, portaged it around uh, the dam itself, finally passed some uh, fenced off areas where um, Doberman pinchers were trying to get at me, which was kind of nerve wracking. I put my kayak back in the water downstream below the dam, and I see my paddle, like I said, stuck in a kind of a root uh, right at the toe of the dam. I said, well, I'm, I'm going to go back upstream and I'm going to retrieve my paddle and, you know, save that investment. I go up to, the, to that location. I try to go and reach my paddle. I, I see it kind of flowing there. It goes further down the water, down the water, down. I realized there were about 15, 20 minutes. I was about at a 45 degree angle myself, right at the toe of the dam. Uh, and that's one of the first things that I think I realized that maturity gives you uh, my second trip around that I was not going to become a casualty <laughs> at the toe of the dam and drown uh, right there. Uh, so I left good enough alone and kind of left that asset and went down the river without my paddle. I show you that because um, the video I took of that particular low water dam has a lot of uh, swear words in it <laughs> that I can't show for a public distribution. I was so upset. So for the, going further on east into Colorado, some things to note uh, about the river. Um, uh, there's a lot of historical areas. This actually is Bent's Fort. And now we're talking about this location on the river as we talked about the map before uh, near uh, La Junta, Colorado. Uh, and this area here, I'll just point out, becomes an area where um, the water gets put out in diversion dams. The water goes out in diversion dams into irrigation area for the crops, which at this point basically uh, is for alfalfa uh, and soybeans, sometimes corn, comes back into the river itself and then goes back out again. So it's like a breathing mechanism. Every time it goes out, it collects uh, uh, minerals and deposits and comes back in It deposit those into the river. So it becomes a very polluted river uh, as, as it goes forward here down this area. Um, so uh, as I said, being managed uh, every, every which way if you can since that point in time. Um, historically, uh, the water was used to go ahead and fuel the sugar beet and the melon uh, kind of production, which is still very prominent around Rocky Ford and so forth. Um, the reality is that, uh, that they had to grow those crops because it was so it's such bad quality water. That's all that could be sustained. Um, more, most of the water really is actually harvested uh, for use of the CFNI steel manufacturing company in Pueblo. Uh, there's a big story about that as well, but the remaining water goes downstream to fund the irrigation. Historically, <clears throat> this is Ben's Fort. Uh, and you can see at, at uh, Pueblo, I mean, in La Junta, if you've not had a chance to visit this National Historic Site, which does have uh, really good reenactors there, please take an opportunity, very historic um, as one goes forward here. Uh, working my way further on to the east, uh, again, more diversion dams, but the diversion dams are located in historic locations. This happens to be a location of the first Fort Lyons uh, and uh, Ben's second fort, which got re relocated here, one of the few kind of areas that had water and had good, um, good views of the river here on top of the, of the Mesa here. Uh, and with a little more history here as well. So portaging around the uh, remains of New Ben's with New Fort and Fort Lyon, original Fort Lyon. These uh, outcroppings here were well known to those in the Santa Fe Trail and Native Americans. So Mr. Bent, after the first fort burned down, decided to relocate it here. It's now a site of one of the diversion dams. There are carvings and uh, people's signatures from the Santa Fe Trail days. On the so I had to go ahead and you know, portage around that area to get further on downstream. Here's a picture that talks more about the irrigation aspects. These are the number of irrigation ditches that are consumed by the, by the Arkansas River being diverting water uh, off the Arkansas River and coming back into place. And this kind of shows you here that diversion water comes back in and goes back into the river itself and kind of as a breathing mechanism. Um, so a huge amount of the water gets divided in this location all the way down to John Martin Reservoir and beyond into Kansas as well. Uh, so what impact does all this have on the river? Uh, well, I'll show you here. So again, this is the place where the Arkansas River comes in and gets divided between the ditch irrigation systems in the Arkansas River. So I'll show you, this is the inflow of the river. This is the Rocky Ford Ditch Irrigation Diversion Dam. As I swing around, you'll see the remnants of the river 
after the water is taken. And you can see the river is virtually non-existent. It's a dry bed. Keep on swinging around and you can see there's where all the water is in the ditch irrigation system, virtually brimful. Very interesting. So for me, the idea of this where the sentiment came into me to go ahead and say that people carry a great deal about the water the Arkansas River brings it in in this section of the world, but very few, if nobody cares about the Arkansas River. And I understand the needs for economic and so forth to uh, provide a livelihood out there and you know, taking 50%, 70%, maybe even 90% of the water may be justifiable to a degree, but taking 100% to me does not seem appropriate. That's my personal context, but that's where the water goes. And I say that from a, a position where I grew up on the Arkansas River back in the 60s in Dodge City, where it flowed most of the time and sometimes did now, did not. Now to a situation where it does not flow at all and occasionally does by virtue of, of heavy rains. Uh, saying that, the water does go out and come back in and creates places like John Martin Reservoir, which again is used for irrigation purposes and to fulfill the water rights for Kansas coming down. You may recall the big uh, lawsuits between Kansas and Colorado, uh, the, which giving the Arkansas River Compact. Just to let you know, that was actually put together back in the, uh, in the 1902, 1907. Um, and um, I'm going to have a question here. Yeah. Uh, have they done studies on the impacts on wildlife and uh, migrating birds in the sections of the river where water is non existent? I believe they have. Uh, I'm not a privy to those uh, particular type of, of researches, but it certainly has had a great deal of impact on uh, the fishing industry and, and, the, and the, uh, uh, the aquatic life or lack thereof by virtue of taking all the water. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm not privy to those. Obviously it's been, been a dramatic impact. Um, I'll show you some of the stuff here in just a second on wildlife. Um, thank you for that question. I'm glad people are using that. So please keep on uh, providing some, some questions as, as they come up. So water comes in. Uh, again, like a breathing system into John Martin Reservoir. John Martin Reservoir is important because now it becomes the regulatory body for releasing the amount of water into uh, the Arkansas River for Kansas. Let's go back again to the Arkansas River Compact. Uh, back in uh, the 1900s, uh, it was the uh, largest litigation in the Supreme Court at that point in time uh, and negotiated between the two states how much water should be, be, uh, be, be allocated to both areas. Mind you, the federal government does not regulate that kind of water as far as water itself. It's up to the states to regulate that uh, with rare instances. Um, and that was renegotiated again in the early 2000s between Kansas and Colorado. And so John Martin now regulates that water stream. I tell you that because when I, when I camped here the night before, there was no water coming out of this stream you see in this location here. And I was just depressed because I couldn't float the river. You can't do it, but it's not, not existent. I wake up in the morning and here it's flowing like gangbusters. And what had happened is that Kansas had called uh, Colorado to go ahead and release their amount of water. And all of a sudden 1200 cubic feet per second comes out of the river. Uh, and I'm riding the wave, if you will, going down river. And it looks beautiful uh, as, as one goes forward. Um, and these are what salt cedars. And here's what it looks like. Beautiful river. Uh, and here's where the vegetation comes back into play. The salt cedars have been maligned because they take a lot of water out of the system, but it does provide some vegetation for, uh, for wildlife and birds and ducks to occur. And, and it's like an oasis, wherever there is water, wildlife comes back into play. So I can't answer your question completely. It has a tremendous impact on, on the fisheries, obviously, and aquatic life, the absence of water. But where there is water, there's life and it comes back into play. Uh, and during this time period where there was water, people were using it quite a bit. Uh, and you can see people that, oh my gosh, there's one of the roads, go ahead and take a tube out and float it. because It's such a rare occurrence that they decided to go ahead and use it that way. Now, there are people along the ways in eastern Colorado. Let me, let me back up a second as well. Colorado approaches the Arkansas River differently than uh, east of Colorado. 
uh, east, uh, east of Colorado, people can camp on the side of the river. They can access the river because it's a federal waterway uh, and has that kind of protection. Kansas provides that protection. Colorado, it's different. You can actually own in Colorado the riverbed itself. You don't own the water, but you own the water bed. So if you are on the water itself, and uh, you're fine, but if your paddle touches the bottom, you are in essence trespassing. Um, so I had to go ahead and, and there's heavily fences. People will fence across the river uh, with barbed wire, sometimes electric wire, uh, very close to getting guillotine. Um, so I had to go and manage and do things somewhat surreptitiously to get down the river until I got into Colorado. These are folks obviously that were willing to go and take that risk. Probably they own the property and able to go and use it on a regular basis. Those though that own the property then want to go and manage it and kill off the vegetation so it won't suck as much water out. And here's what that looks like, which was just devastating to me. So I don't know exactly what's going on here, but this is about a half a mile to the west of the Kansas border on the north side of the river. And as you can see, it's just totally defoliated. Everything has dead. And I just don't understand how or why. So that's what it kind of looks like from that point. I, I get was very devastated about that. And when we talked about the water quality in western, uh, eastern Kansas, western, eastern Colorado, western Kansas, it is so bad that now the communities that relied upon water along the Arkansas River, Rocky Ford, La Hunta, Las Animas, Lamar, are now considering what's called a big conduit to intercept the water earlier on just below Pueblo and put it into a pipe so it doesn't get polluted. So they actually drink the water as opposed to paying for very expensive water uh, purification systems, reverse osmosis, et cetera, to take out all the pollutants. Uh, suffice it to say, when it arrives Kansas, it is a very uh, well regulated and heavily polluted water stream. That's probably the bigger story. Here it is kind of crossing over uh, just uh, past uh, near Coolidge, Kansas. Here I am kind of uh, in that area watching it. I show you this because this is the gauge that indicates how much water comes together. So I said we were releasing 1200 cubic feet per second from John Martin Reservoir. It arrives at Kansas at exactly 620 cubic feet per second because that's what it has to be by virtue of the Colorado Arkansas River, uh, Colorado Kansas Arkansas River Compact. Water is still flowing. Uh, people though use it in ways that are inappropriate. You can see they kind of harvest water when they, when they want to, perhaps illegally, which was unfortunate. I met some wonderful people though uh, in, in, the, in the area uh, around Lakin and so forth. And uh, the adage I had on my trip is that whenever anybody asked me to do something, I'd say yes. A gentleman approached me in Lake and saying, I appreciate your trip and your story. Have you ever ridden a horse uh, in the water before? I said, no, I've never done that before. And so I said, yes, I'll go ahead and do that. And it was great fun. Yep. Having a chance to go ahead and ride a horse in the water and actually have it swim slice because it's such an unusual event. It was terrific. So uh, that was one of the lessons I learned from the trip is that when people ask you to do something, I should say yes. Uh, getting down to Deerfield, and I show you this picture because now it's not like Kansans are great and Coloradans are bad, uh, if you want to put in those parlance or the ditch irrigation issues. This is right outside of Deerfield, again, where the water coming in gets diverted 100%. Uh, to the ditch irrigation system and leaves the place in Deerfield uh, now being a dry stream bed again in western Kansas. So Deerfield to Wichita looks like this, this section, uh, very close to where you guys are in El Dorado, uh, just to Wichita itself. And here's what it looks like. It's a dry stream bed. Our Kansas River below Deerfield becomes uh, this area and becomes actually an area now which is being used for uh, mostly for ATVs and those sort of things in what used to be a flowing river. So this is just down river of the farmer's ditch and you can see the Arkansas River is gone. That's just the reality. So my trip is now going to be augmented by either walking or ATVs or just researching on my own till we get to about Hutchinson or Wichita. I will have to admit it's a sad sight to see. And again, this was the river that was used with the border between Kansas, between the United States and Mexico and Spain. It was a formal thing to be crossed for the Santa Fe Trail. It was flowing during the 1950s, and now it is a dry stream bed. 
It's not like it wasn't always that way. This is Garden City with a bridge that was done, I believe, during a somewhat high flow, but not flood stage activities crossing over a formable river. Now you can see on the right where the same bridge is today. This is what it looked like again back in the 1800s, uh, early 1900s, and what it is today, a dry riverbed. It was used as well for irrigation purposes, and you can see that this was uh, a location. This is what's called the Great Sewell Ditch out near Dodge City, and you can actually see the remnants of this today as well as you drive along Highway 54 and Highway 50. Um, this is a location where they try to divert the raw water for your ditch irrigation all the way up to uh, around Spearville and those sort of things. You can see individuals digging it by hand. Uh, the investors actually sell it off to another set of investors that lost a shirt. It did not work. Here is a story as well for Western Kansas, so it gives you a sense of, of kind of proportion. This is the amount of water that's being used throughout the state of Kansas, a 2017 report, and this talks about how much water is being used. The blue area is water being used, uh, Free Municipal being red, much more in this area here, uh, Sedgwick County, et cetera, Butler County you can see as well, but the huge amount of water being used for irrigation hundreds of thousands of acre feet per year. An acre foot is a, uh, a basically an acre foot of water, uh, an, acre of wa an acre being flooded with one foot of water. That's an acre foot. Basically taking a football field and flooding it one foot deep, that's one acre foot. Hundreds of thousands of water being used for irrigation to the point where they actually change the humidity patterns in these parts of the state. So a lot of water being consumed out of the area, mostly out of the Algalala Aquifer that has an impact on the Arkansas River itself. Unfortunately, the river is, the the Ovalada Aquifer is depleting in most areas. These are the dark red areas. Some does get recharged, not much, uh, but they really call it water mining. And the effects of water mining out in this area has had a dramatic effect on the Arkansas River. This is what it looks like in Dodge City. This is where I joined my trip in 2000, in 1976. It now again is a dry stream bed, which really is unfortunate. So I converted my trip into ways of conveying wherever I could. Moving forward, I used Conestoga. Somebody asked, well, do you wanna go ahead and kind of use a Conestoga wagon all on the river? And my answer was, yes, we'll go ahead and do it. So I put my kayak in the back of a Conestoga wagon, did that for a while. Another gentleman, they said, well, do you wanna go ahead and you ride an ATV on, on the river and work that stuff through and kind of see what it looks like going down with an ATV? ATV? And I said, yes. Uh, because I wanted to have that experience. So this is what it looks like going down the stream bed in the near Dodge City as we go forward. Hell of a lot faster than kayaking. So now it's being used for recreation purposes uh, to go ahead and what they call, they actually have an annual event now called the Pecker Run, which goes basically from Dodge City, from Garden City to Dodge City as a race or a kind of a rendezvous activity. Uh, past Dodge City, there is some light. The Ogallada comes back into the play. The, the surface water comes, comes back to a degree. And where there is water, there is life. There are these oases along the river small patches which has a great deal of water and it becomes a place of wildlife and aquatic life and other vegetation becomes a beautiful oasis. Uh, again, the river becomes something that is non-existent all the way up to Great Bend and beyond. You know that in your area. It didn't used to be that way. This is what Great Bend used to look like in the Arkansas River in the 18s, 1870s. It was a formidable river crossing, hence its historic significance we go forward. Going on, on my trip here further to the east, uh, going down in the territory, the river comes back to life to a degree and, and water comes into flow to a point. I still couldn't float this, but at least there's some water coming in the Arkansas River. Um, to the point now near Hutchinson, uh, they have now some uh, personal conveyors, basically a business called the Arkanoo Kayak and Canoe Rental. If you've not done it, it's not too far away from you all, obviously. And you take day trips and kayak, a kayak through uh, Hutchinson. Uh, it takes about three or four hours. Uh, their clientele ranges from basically 20 to 80 years old. 80% are females, which is kind of interesting. So many people will kind of do that purpose, grab some wine and have a great float throughout the day. Their business has doubled each year. They've been in business now about five years, but a great opportunity. People now are starting to use the river because it's actually coming back and being used for beneficial use as going forward. So that's that, that's that part. Then, I, then Wichita to Tulsa. Now, Wichita to Tulsa, because my, my trip changes, 
you may have seen that my kayak was on a vehicle. For the first uh, third of the trip, I was using a vehicle where I would basically put my vehicle uh, downstream and get right back upstream and float down to my vehicle wherever I could each day. Uh, now I transition to basically just starting at Wichita and moving all down and being on the river solely with just my kayak. This is the traction I'm talking about, very close to you guys. Um, the, and the river looks like this. And I thought, man, for, for the rest of my trip, I'm going to have great water coming out of, of Wichita. This is just below the, uh, the low water dam, uh, just below the downtown area of Wichita. Good flow had just opened up just for me a few minutes before. I didn't cause it, but it just happened to be by happenstance. So I'm riding the wave here. I said, great, now I can keep on going and won't have to go ahead and pull my kayak. Back on the Ark River again, just leaving Wichita right below the Lincoln Low Water Dam, Lincoln Street Low Water Dam. Fortunately for me, they decided to open up more floodgates just before I started, so I'm letting the water rise a little bit before I head down. That's always a good omen. So from here on down, I'm basically on my own, but for the good graces of friends and relatives as I meet on down the river, which I suspect will be plentiful. Good day. But that was not to be the case. So someday I'll be able to get on a river that actually has water in it, enough to float, but not today. You know, perhaps another tablespoon of water and it might help. So use the river to camp out on and it was very beautiful and pretty, but it became really stretch, uh, strenuous to trying to go ahead and kind of camp and those sort of things and pull the kayak through, but work those things through. So here, um, I also get down to the area, which is the Uring City, I think the Walnut is obviously on the east side of, of El Dorado and flows into this location, the Arkansas River. Beautiful location, beautiful river. The confluence there, fishing is great. When I met some Walnut. friends there, uh, the Arkansas River. Good place to fish. Really a pretty river. And hopefully diminish the sandbars. Because right at this location is also at Sonoa. And if you've not recognized it, this really is the location, uh, you know, Coronado and the areas kind of around that time visited, we think as well. Uh, these round huts were very prominent. So we estimate at the confluence of the Walnut and the Arkansas River, 40,000 Native Americans lived, maybe as many as 70,000 all the way up to, to Hutchinson. And that's the history I do not know much about. But a Wichita State University professor is investigating that area very heavily. And you can actually see if you go the area of the confluence of the walnut and the arkansas you can see these round the remnants of these round huts very prominently on google earth where etsanoa was further on down to oklahoma now you get into reservoir management and reservoirs get to be difficult to cross uh, wherever i was going it seemed to be always a headwind trying to locate those sort of things so move forward as, as far as that's concerned reservoirs became uh, difficult uh, i was doing a video for my brother uh, and this kind of gives you a feel what it's like to go ahead and cross a reservoir uh, in the afternoon. So Pete, thought I'd kind of give you a little dose of what it looks like to be on the uh, Ka Reservoir. Um, so I'm going to do the poor man's version of, uh, of a GoPro, holding it between my teeth. Uh, you'll be able to go and see the point I'm heading to. It's about a 14 mile journey all the way around this point. Uh, this is probably about seven miles to that point. Probably take me about an hour or two to get there. Uh, but you can kind of get a taste of what it's like to be in my boat. Here you go. I sound like Darth Vader to a degree, but it gives you a sense of what it looks like being in my boat on a reservoir. Uh, when it gets down below the reservoir, the reservoirs manage the water, not so much for water supply, but for energy. Um, so hydroelectric power, so they will hold back the water and then turn it on at like three in the afternoon for air conditioning and so forth, making it totally impassable for me to get down further. 
Um, I then get down to Tulsa, finally by hook or by crook, dragging, etc. cetera. Uh, and in 76, I did the same thing, but in 76, I actually got my kayak stolen. This is me. I then went through some repair, got it back and went on down river. Um, it was kind of interesting because I was kind of the yuck factor in both the, uh, in 76 and Los Angeles Times and New York Times um, saying a lone kayaker gets kayak stolen on solo trip. So I was the, the yuck factor. But it's important to kind of look at Tulsa to the Mississippi River is the next section in this area, really kind of the last section through Arkansas. And that really the story here is about the McClellan Kerr navigation system. Uh, there are a series of about 19 different uh, locks and dams, uh, and Senator Kerr and Senator McClellan were the ones that negotiated this improvement because Eisenhower needed to have two more Senate votes to put in the interstate highway system, and they said we'll vote for the interstate highway system if you give us the navigation system they are Kansas. He said yes, they did, and they put the system in place. About 30 percent of the grain in Kansas comes down the Arkansas River through the Port of Catoosa, which is where I started as well. You can see the barges here on the Port of Catoosa just downstream of where it is. Um, so you can see there's now 8, 12, 12, 10 barges together at a time going because that's the capacity of the various uh, of the locks and dams going through this area. Um, I restarted my trip in 76 there. I started my trip again in 2018 uh, and worked through the, uh, the uh, locks and dam system. Uh, no alligators, there were alligators in Arkansas City, I mean, in Arkansas, which is kind of interesting as we go through it. The, it is beautiful to go ahead beautiful and see this territory on the, the edges. Side. I show this to you as a way to kind of give you a sense of the serene nature of the Arkansas River going through uh, and kind of the beautiful nature of what it looks like uh, in this area. Uh, going on further down into eastern uh, into eastern Oklahoma, uh, crossing over to Arkansas, uh, you can see bridges cross the river quite regularly. Uh, however, Weber the problem Falls is Falls Bridge, which unfortunately in 2002, a barge crashed into one of the pilings and the bridge collapsed, killing about 19 people. There's a monument somewhere around here as well, but uh, that lets you know it. These boats are big and could be hazardous. Weber Falls Bridge. So here's what happened back in 2002. A barge gets loose and the person couldn't hit the, hit the pylons and the individuals then drove into the river. So be mindful crossing rivers that it's a big river and commerce is an important issue. If you've never gone through a lock and dam, it's kind of interesting. Um, I did go through the lock and dam as an individual and you can actually get done, it's a free service. Uh, and one that is we all pay for our tax dollars and you can go through as an individual canoeist or kayaker as well. This lets you know the, the power of hydraulic pressure. Uh, this uh, lock, uh, these, these barges being lifted up out of the water uh, and then moving on down river as for now they make these barges just large enough to go and fit into the lock and dam itself uh, with a very few inches to go to spare. I was there in 1976 in Fort Smith, moving on down that point. And in 76, I actually joined onto a towboat, roping barges through the Arkansas River. This is a picture of a similar boat I did in 2000 and 1976. I joined my friends and my friends actually towed me across Arkansas in similar fashion in 2018, wrong date that way. But this is like that. Seven and a half miles an hour. Seven point two. It looks that looks good. You can see on the on my bit my kayak as well. I now have a flag and a reflector because a radar reflector because there's so much barge traffic going through. Hit the mouth of the Mississippi. Uh, and we'll conclude here pretty quick. The mouth of the Mississippi. The mouth of the White and the mighty Mississippi. It's only five hundred and ninety miles to go. A little cloudy day, but doing okay. Go down about nine miles and pull off. Should be good. So that's the last part of the trip, 600 miles on the Mississippi, large area. So this is one of the larger tows I've seen in the river so far. 49 barges all lashed together. And what a deal.
So I felt like a matchstick basically on the river itself. Uh, again, I came across areas, I remember a houseboat from that point, uh, coming to a houseboat actually using the river for recreation. I come across it and they said, do you want a beer? I said, yes, great. I then go on down the river and find out this gentleman could not start his craft and was stranded in the middle of the river. So I went back up and rescued him. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, I couldn't have done this months before. So able to go and do rescuing opportunities, which was cool. <laughs> I felt pretty proud of that activity. It's beautiful, the Mississippi is. You can see this kind of nice sunset camping out. People are afraid of these large rivers, but these were the super highways, obviously, uh, going forward here. Thomas, Heading on down to, yes. I don't mean to interrupt, but everything is frozen. Ah, I think we're back now. Oh, really? Okay. Okay, thank you. Not a problem. This is Natchez, Mississippi, uh, and going forward here, and um, the uh, you can see that Natchez being in this location here, the, the riverfront of Natchez. I was suffering from heat exhaustion, so uh, I kind of pulled myself after a river for a while, went on down to Baton Rouge, and you can see here's where the big tankers large come in. Large ships, Baton Rouge, Mississippi River, in addition to large towboats. Uh, Baton Rouge. The reason why they're, the ships go into here is because of Baton Rouge, the, the bridges get shorter and the large super tankers can't go up river from this point. Going down to New Orleans kind of gives you a sense of perspective of how my small kayak compares to the large container ships. Pit, pit, pit ships get bigger and bigger and bigger. These are all the tankers parked outside of New Orleans kind of waiting their chance to get through. Uh, here's what the video looks like. So this gives you a little different perspective but a perspective of metal kayak against some of these large boats all stacked up here on the Mississippi River getting ready to I believe load up in New Orleans given that they're empty really cool so I end up down at Venice Light uh, on Labor Day um, and my wife and several friends joined me uh, at that point in time. And here's the vision I had at the end of the trip to go ahead and actually pour a drop of water from Tennessee Pass down to the Gulf of Mexico. All the way from Tennessee Pass to the Gulf of Mexico. Woo! Woo! Oh, there you go. One, two, three. Uh, yeah! Oh, I got a pee. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So you can pick your spouse, but you can't pick your relatives, all right? So uh, those sort of things. So I, I kind of, I'll sum up the, the, the process here in the next few minutes um, about stuff that I learned on this trip. I think that would be, uh, it would be somewhat vacuous if I didn't kind of give you some senses of that. What I learned, I learned to keep promises to yourself. As I said, I've been looking at this for some 42 years and I recognized I needed to really kind of fulfill that promise to myself. Since I'm kind of in the retirement age, I learned that mature people can still have adventures. We have to regulate that and do it in our physical means, but that doesn't mean we can't have adventures. For me, it's important to note that I'm not retiring, that I'm just entering another chapter in my life. Um, and I had learned that the environment, um, uh, let me back up, that the, the environment and the politics of the Arkansas River and Mississippi River have changed over time, uh, but not the people. Uh, which is interesting. Uh, and the people are still very wonderful. Everyone that I met, black and white, Republican, Democrat, rich, poor, would be willing to give the shirt off their back for me, uh, which was just phenomenal. This also kind of matured into some personal advice that I would pass on to you, is to get healthy and stay healthy, to be yourself, to do what you, what you need to do, uh, for me, it's important to have humility and perseverance. I want to be constantly learning. I want to adapt. I want to assume a good intent for individuals. I'm going to listen uh, and believe that what I, what I believe is my destiny. And if I can believe those things and things come forward, I think that's important. Uh, some probably more importantly, things to remember. You're never too old, too young, inexperienced, etc. I think you have those things to look at. Live your life in a way that others will want to follow. You know, you spend your, put your butt into a kayak for three months, you start thinking about these sort of things. Be inspired and inspiring. Make progress, not solutions. 
find your own adventures and do them. Things that I remember. Let me conclude with these. For me, one of my future efforts that I, I learned from this activity and kind of the, the second time around doing this trip, I recognize that I need to deepen my relationships with my family and friends. And I came home to me the fact that time is the only non-renewable source that we have. Everything else is, as you can get back to a degree, but not time. And I forgot about that and recaptured that understanding on this trip. So I felt I needed to go ahead and deepen my relationship with my family and friends who are the most important. I want to advance a culture of mutual caring for the Kansas City and metro area. I've been involved in local government for a long time. I want to make sure that the Kansas City metro area tries to be as cohesive and as nurturing as possible for the community writ large for 2.2 million people. I want to inspire and nurture the current and future generations of public servants. That's why I'm teaching at the University of Kansas as a professor of practice to try to teach the next generation of public servants. I think that really is important for our communities, our country, uh, and our livelihoods for our kids and grandkids to have good thriving communities. And I'm doing this as well because I want to advocate for the Arkansas River and the world environment. It is disappointing to me that the 45th longest river in the world, the sixth longest river in the United States, we basically have drained it dry during my lifetime, and it's not going to come back. So I hope you've enjoyed this presentation, at least for a little bit of a time here. Uh, I'm going to keep moving from here to wherever to, uh, this river takes me, and I want to say thank you very much for allowing me to share at least part of my understanding and learning from my great trip. With that, Trisha, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much. Um, we missed a little bit at the end. Some things froze up, at least for me on my end. Hopefully they worked for everyone else. Um, we do have one hand raised. Phyllis Booth has her hand raised. Phyllis, I'm gonna allow you to talk if you have a microphone. If not, you'll need to ask the question um, in the Q&A. It was very interesting, I enjoyed learning about the Arkansas River from him. He had some very fascinating information. Could you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, I, I enjoyed it too. I would love to do a similar trip, so. Yeah, it's worthwhile. Very educational, appreciate it. I didn't hear that, Trish, but that's okay. <laughs> oh. All right. So Phyllis, do you have a specific question? No, I don't think okay. so. Huh? All right, just wanted to make sure um, I didn't miss anything. And Tricia, uh, I, see, I see some stuff in the chats, but I can't see them. Are there questions people have? Um, there were several from me to you saying we were frozen. Um, Sandra Taylor says, wonderful presentation, very informative. Um, Good. I was never frozen. You weren't? You were seeing it the whole way? Yes. Excellent, I'm glad to hear that. All right, um, Hannes, thank you so very much. Uh, very informative, very good presentation. We really appreciated it. Um, Life Enrichment will be back um, November the 3rd. I am working on confirming that speaker now, um, but we will get the word out. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone, and have a wonderful Tuesday. Thanks, Trish, for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. <laughs>